Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a Triad production. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guest today is Eric Emides. Eric is a globally recognized speaker, entrepreneur, and author known for his expertise in health, business, and personal development. With a mission to empower individuals to live healthier, more fulfilling lives, Eric is the founder of WildFit, a revolutionary health program designed to transform people's relationships with food and with their bodies. As a speaker, Eric has shared his insights on stages around the world, inspiring audiences with a wide range of topics from optimizing health and wellness to unlocking peak performance in business and in life. With a commitment to ongoing learning and personal growth, Eric remains dedicated to empowering individuals and communities to thrive in every aspect of their lives. We're excited to have Eric with us today to discuss diabetic food mentality and his book, Post Diabetic. Eric, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, looking forward to our chat. It's nice to be here with you. You know, Eric, as uh, we start out, what was your, your, your own life experience with diabetes? You know, um, I think I was a lot like other people. I, I knew it existed. I, I, wasn't, um, I wasn't aware how serious it was. And mm -hmm. uh, I found myself kind of uh, stumbling into that world because I had uh, started doing some coaching around just food behavior, just, just mm -hmm. helping people change their psychology about food. And, and we started getting this very common comment. And the common comment was that I am no longer type 2 diabetic. I am now pre-diabetic. And as we had not developed our food programs with the specific intention of reversing diabetes or, or even weight loss for that matter, when we kept getting these stories, it was, it was quite interesting to us. And uh, in particular, one of the things that bothered me is that if somebody is type 2 diabetic and they're now pre-diabetic, then I don't think pre-diabetic is, I don't think that's the right word for it anymore. Yes. And, and, I, you know, and, and my logic about this is, is you know, kind of clear, I think, first of all, the word pre-diabetic has, in a sense, like a sort of hypnotic suggestion in. You are headed in a particular direction. If you are pre-diabetic, you are now in danger of progressing toward type 2 diabetes. That's the first problem. Second problem is that if somebody is pre-diabetic but trending in the other direction, I would argue that they actually have a very different medical circumstance and therefore they should have very different diagnosis and, and, and prognosis and, and prescription for that matter. So in other words, you have two clients that have exactly the same metrics in every possible way. One is trending toward type 2 diabetes and the other one is trending away. Yeah. Their medical advice should reflect that trend. And so to call them both pre-diabetic is, well, wrong. And then there's another issue, and that is that somebody who goes into full remission, that they move out of even pre-diabetic range and now they're completely normalized, we still believe that they should be classified as post-diabetic because they've demonstrated a propensity for it. And so therefore they need to be a little more careful than the average person. And, and so that, that um, classification of post-diabetic, I think is medically important. And luckily uh, many doctors agree with me and it's starting to, ha it's starting to be picked up as, as proper terminology. Really good. I think these, there's some really key pieces here that I want to expand upon in our show uh, that I think are so important just in our mindset, because our mindset is everything about how we're going to be dealing with something, living in fear, living in hope, all those things that come into play here. Just, just, just so we're, we're talking and we're th throwing around some different diagnoses, type one, type two. If you would differentiate these two for us and uh, their typical etiology. Sure. You know, so I, I would actually say type one, type two, and type three. And I'll say, you know, type one is frankly a completely different disease. It's a completely different thing. And to our knowledge, it's not reversible. And another way of referring to it is insulin dependent um, uh, diabetes. And, and this is a, a condition that generally people get when they're quite young and then they have to live with it. They require insulin to process any carbohydrates and the lack of insulin is frankly dangerous to fatal for them. They account for something like 5% of diabetics. The type two diabetes is, well, in most languages, like if you, if you, if you go and look up type two diabetes, the, the, there's a name for it in Estonian or in Dutch and many countries around the world, you'll find that they call it, the, the direct translation from those languages is sugar sickness. Uh -huh. and, um, and so to a large degree, what we're really talking about is, is that the body is no longer functionally um, processing sugar. It's, it, you know, you develop some insulin resistance problems and now the body's not really 
dealing with that very well. And, and, and so that, you know, that's where you move into type two diabetes. And this is what I would regard as an optional version of diabetes. You don't have to have it. You can turn it around. Unfortunately, the medical establishment at the moment, they treat it as a, uh, as a chronic disease that must be medicated and managed for life. And I think that that's part of the paradigm that we want to change. And then I would argue that over the coming years, you're going to start seeing uh, Alzheimer's in certain forms of dementia as being referred to as, as type 3 diabetes or insulin resistance problems in the brain. And, and again, that would fall under the category of optional um, and, you know, it, it doesn't need to be that way. There is one big difference though, and, and you know, I'm, I'm not a neuroscientist here, but my understanding um, uh, of the comparison is that with type 2 diabetes, it is, it is almost always reversible. What might not be reversible is the permanent damage done after many years of having the, the condition. In the case of dementia, in the case of Alzheimer's, it doesn't appear to be reversible, but it does seem to be haltable preventable and haltable. In other words, if somebody has started to develop, um, you know, uh, uh, some cognition memory problems, um, they, it does seem as though they are able to slow the progression or stop the progression, but it doesn't it currently seem as though they can undo the damage that was done. So in that case, prevention is even more important. Absolutely. I love that piece. You're talking about prevention and just as you're trailing off with this piece right here, you know, there are different types of prevention aren't there. There's primary, secondary, and tertiary. And the the primary is is living a lifestyle and living a life such that you know we don't get into some of the things that can lead us down the type two diabetic path, and then you know the secondary prevention is well something's already showing some signs and then we take some steps and then third is you're kind of involved and you're doing some damage control around that. So I love the idea of prevention, both primary and secondary, and I love this idea that you're reminding us that this is referring to type two. It's reversible and haltable if it were in type, you know, type three. In leading into this, you state that, you know, if you're struggling with type two diabetes, or let's say obesity or hypertension, you say you should know two important things. One, it's not your fault. And then two, it's your responsibility, though, to turn things around. That's right. Talk some more about this decisional personal responsibility crossroads that you're identifying for folks. Well, I think I think if we if we start with the it's not your fault premise, and this is a very very important premise. It, you know, anybody who's watching, listening, you know, to to our conversation that might be carrying a few pounds that they'd rather they weren't, you have to know they've put a lot of effort into trying to get rid of them, but that's failed them, and there's a reason, and it's not their fault. And the same thing with type two diabetes is that there's sort of this accepted idea that if you've got one of these lifestyle conditions, that it's your yeah. fault, and and it starts frankly with the phrase lifestyle disease. And I would put to you that the phrase lifestyle disease was something that was cooked up in a think tank of the food and tobacco industries in order to shift the blame for the disastrous damage that their products were doing to people. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, this might sound a little conspiracy theorist to you, but mm -hmm. there are two ways to tamper with a jury. The one way is to find out where the jurors live and extort them or blackmail them or threaten them. But the other way to tamper with the jury, which is legal, is to create a pervasive idea in the population so that the jury was tampered with before they even got pulled into jury duty. And so what do I mean by this? Well, if you're a tobacco or food company, you start getting worried about class action or, you know, in a sense, product liability suits. You start being concerned about that. And so what you want to do is you want to start calling lung cancer a lifestyle disease so that someone sitting on a jury at your trial will be predisposed to blame the consumer. And frankly, that worked beautifully for them all the way through the 70s and 80s. They barely lost a single case. It did start to shift toward the 90s as people both began to wake up to what they did to hide the consequences from people. But then what did they do? As they saw their businesses under tremendous threat, they started divesting and reinvesting and, and buying up food companies. And so we're starting to see that exact same thought process. It was soft drink companies that came up with the idea that you could outrun or outcycle the calories that you were about to put in. They did that because they saw people, consumers becoming concerned about wanting to reduce their calorie intake. And they said, you don't need to reduce your calorie intake. You just need to move more. Right. When I say it's not your fault, I mean, it's not your fault. I mean that we, you know, you don't have a lifestyle disease. You have a disease that is, is a direct result of um, immoral and unethical activity on the behalf of a profit-seeking food industry, and then frankly, a disastrously um, misinformed diet industry. So, you know, you, you start there, but then you do have to move to the next, you know, y y y it may not be your fault, but there's no point playing victim here. It's not your fault and you are a victim, 
but a good victim heals thyself. And that that's the point in time where you're saying, you know what? I get that they did this to me. I get that they harmed me and they are never going to fix it for me. So that means I'm the only one that can. Yeah. I think there's something in that that's both empowering and freeing. And I yeah. think you're right in my, uh, in my work uh, with those that have diabetes, I was um, at a medical center for a number of years and I ran a, a group, a support group for about seven years of that. And I'm going to use the word just for a lifestyle, just for a second, that we we, we discussed many, many times how the very things, and I, I live in Hawaii, so we we food and we fellowship here. It's one of the things that we do. And and it's a very, very central part of our of our community, of our, our interrelating, and we have some of the best foods here. Uh, not always the healthiest, and we have some very high diabetic rates, as I'm sure you know, but it's all part of the culture. And so we would talk about the very things that provide personal and oftentimes cultural identity and relational inclusion and fellowship, as well as stress management, are some of the things that we now uh, recognize are negatively contributing to one's health decline yeah. and uh, the need to have those things addressed uh, and often change. And in your book, uh, you identify the diabetic food mentality and how it affects individuals managing diabetes. And explain a little bit more for us about this, uh, as well as contrasting it with traditional approaches and identifying the importance of moving towards greater health with this kind of mindset that changes the narrative that you're identifying for us. You know, there's a, a general thought process, and that is that in order to understand how to solve a problem, you, you kind of have to understand the problem itself. And so if we start with the current paradigm or the current, um, you know, sort of perspective that diabetes yeah. is a chronic disease that has to be managed and medicated for life, yeah. well, then right off the bat, we have a problem because, because that's not what it is. And so that means that any solutions we look for are going to misfire. They're not, they're not going to be appropriate. But just to insert something just real quick, what you're saying right there was something in that you referred to earlier, it's almost, it's almost a hypnotic suggestion and it's shaping the narrative yeah. preemptively. So people only know this because the medical industry is supposed to, you know, are supposed to respect and, and, and trust them. This is the way that they're shaping it. So this becomes our natural mindset. So now we give into and don't recognize that it's anything other than what you just mentioned. And it is a very powerful suggestion that shapes everything, including motivations and our own decision-making, doesn't it? Yeah. And there's another sort of insidious aspect to that. And that is that, um, you know, if somebody goes to the doctor and they have a, a, a cancer diagnosis, I mean, the news is dropped on them like an anvil. Like it's, it's a big diagnosis. I'm really sorry to tell you this. It's very news. When somebody goes to the doctor and to find out they have diabetes, it's like a throwaway. It's like, oh, you're diabetic now. So it was, it was bound to happen and it happens to most people and here's some medication you're going to take. Right. At no point does the doctor tell you how serious this is. Most doctors, and, and, and I know there are many that are now beginning to do this properly, but most doctors are not saying, listen, you're pre-diabetic. I don't know if you understand what this means. You might think that it means that you've eaten a little too much sugar and maybe that's true. But what it also means is you are slowly but surely developing circulatory problems that are going to result in the amputation of minimally your fingers and toes and probably your hands and feet. You're also going to lose your eyesight young and you're likely going to shave about 20 years off your life experience because diabetes is the number one risk factor for cancer and heart disease. And by the way, if there's another pandemic, you're in big trouble. Yeah. This is a serious disease. And, and, and they don't do that. And I think that one of the reasons they don't is, frankly, I hate to say this, and it's I, you're going to ask me to put my tinfoil hat on, but the fact of the matter is, is diabetes is incredibly profitable. Oh, hugely profitable. By the way, by the way that it should not be so profitable. And, and, and as, 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 a, as a demonstration of that, quite aside from the optional basis of it and the reversibility of it, the guy who discovered uh, exogenous insulin is a principle. The guy who figured out that you could extract insulin from dog pancreases and put them into humans and balance out their sugar and then figured out how to synthesize it, Banting, he figured this out. He's a Canadian guy, figured this out and was so convinced that people had the fundamental right to insulin mm -hmm. that he sold the patent to the University of Toronto for a dollar because he it, it, nobody should be making money on this. And somewhere between that decision and today, mm -hmm. now diabetes is going to cost America 400 billion dollars this year. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think there's a tinfoil hat on that one whatsoever. I think we watch what happened with COVID and never one time did you hear, did you hear, hey, there are ways to build up your immune system. Hey, there are ways to reduce your risk to the, to, to the core morbid 
factors involved with COVID yeah. and those that died somewhere up in the 90% were those that had diabetes and those that were experiencing obesity. They were at higher risk. You never heard about lifestyle changes. You Not never heard only. of a hopeful message yeah. that said, hey, guys, this is a this, you know, disease we're still working on, but we also know that there are some comorbid factors that have the ability for you to control. Let's focus on those while we're doing other things. That Frankly, never happens. Why? That. Because the money's in it. Yeah. And if you said that on Twitter, you your account got banned. Like you, 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 you would lose your license if you're a doctor. And if you were to yeah, say that you, the lot of that you can take, yeah. So it's very, very challenging. So what we're going back to here naming, I think we're on a similar page around this and maybe a similar level of frustration is that people don't get the full message. One, in how serious it can be and not just, well, you got something now and let's just live with it for the rest of our lives. But you've got something right now that actually you've got some control over. That's right. How can we help you? And that's what you're doing. You're looking to teach folks you know, ways to manage something that is reversible. How hopeful is that message? But it's it's highly manipulative on the other side when people are trying to, you know, disempower folks and say, well, don't worry about that. That we, we, We've got you treated. But in your book, you discuss importance, the importance of understanding the impact of food choices on blood sugar levels and things that people can do. Yeah. Elaborate for us on some of these insights, these key insights around the paradox of food, et cetera, and also some of the misconceptions that come around that. Would you please? Yeah. So um, a key principle that I, I, I fully believe that 10 years from now, it will be common practice, common knowledge, and, and, and we'll all wonder why we didn't notice it before. But a, a very key principle of our wild fit programs and of our diabetes reversal programs and the book is that humans evolved in order to basically avoid the, the primary threats that humans were facing for most of our evolution. And the biggest threat that we faced was starvation. So we evolved to be like starvation prevention machines. We're very good at preventing starvation. And what that means is, is that we, we evolved metabolic function to optimize our experience of seasonal fluctuation. In the same way that squirrels and chipmunks fatten up for the winter and, 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 and so by the way do bears and a number of other animals, one has to ask, how do they do that? Do they have an app for that? Does their aura ring go off and tell them that it's time for them to put on weight? No. What happens is that mother nature changes food availability for that window of time. Mm -hmm. And so during that particular window of time, in the case of the squirrels and nuts, suddenly there are berries and uh, squirrels and chipmunks and stuff is that there's suddenly nuts and berries in plentitude. And so they're eating these foods, fall foods that are communicating to their system mm -hmm. to slow their metabolism and increase their capacity for food and power up their cravings. Because if they do not fatten up appropriately, they will not make it through the coming winter. Now, the joke of it is, is we're, we're exactly the same. You know, our ancestors uh, say, uh, you know, growing up and evolving in sub-Saharan Africa, the, the, the fall comes along and guess what we have? We have seasonal availability of, of berries and fruits and, and root vegetables and access to honey. And as soon as we started eating those things, we started developing powerful cravings for them so as to make us eat more. We started developing powerful serotonin and dopamine responses to them so that we could geographically lock in the memory of where that tree was. And we also slowed our metabolism down so we'd become ever more efficient at processing the energy we're eating because we needed to store some of it yeah. as glycogen and fat to make sure we got through what was coming. Yeah. And, and when you begin to understand that, you realize, wait a second now, hold on. I have looked around and I see some people that are definitely preparing for winter. I see some people that seem to be preparing for a very serious, some people might be preparing for an ice age. Like they're, 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 they're in full preparation mode, right? And, and it's not that they want to prepare for that. It's not that they're conscious of it. It's that they are stuck in a metabolic mode. And, and it's, it's a perfectly natural evolutionary response. The food industry has hijacked our food system. And so now, yeah. look, I think you and I are old enough to remember what it was like to go to a grocery store. And it's like, no, they don't have mangoes right now because they're not in season. But by now, you can go into any grocery store anywhere because they get them from Costa Rica in August, and then they get them from Guyana in September, and then they get them from somewhere else. So they're basically available all the time. Yeah. And, and that's the good sugars, never mind the processed garbage ones that are definitely available all the time. So when we recognize that that's where the cause lies, that the cause lies in humans have three metabolic modes and they don't switch gears. And if you don't let them switch gears, there's going to be consequences. It is important that we run all three metabolic modes on an, at least an annual basis, if not more often. If we don't do that, there's going to be a consequence. The question is, how do we switch gears? Well, mm. we don't. Mother Nature used to switch the gears for us. Yeah. In other words, 
after all these carbs are, are, are available, suddenly they're gone. Mother Nature goes, oh, look, you don't need willpower. They're just gone. You're sad about it? I don't care. They're gone. And you're sad for a few days. And then after a few days, your candida dies off and your cravings die down and you're no longer fussed about it. But now you're looking for food. Only you've moved into winter. And in winter, there's a drought. There's not a lot of water. The plants aren't growing very well. The hunting is pretty tough. It's a tough time. And so you switch into the next metabolic mode. You start burning some fat, but eventually your body goes, this is really scary. We haven't eaten for a few days. And it starts burning protein. And that sounds like a bad thing to a lot of people. It does. I mean, a lot of people, gym trainers like, oh, you don't want to burn your lean muscle. Mass. No, 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 no. Your body is unbelievably intelligent. It burns the old, sick, and diseased proteins first. And you need to do that from time to time. Our bodies not only evolve to survive these seasonal changes, but to utilize them. And then, of course, what happens next? The, the, the skies go dark and lightning starts ripping through the horizon. Thunder rolls across the sky and the rains begin. And the green shoots start shooting up and the hunting becomes prolific and amazing. And you suddenly enter a period of calorie abundance no carbohydrates, but massive calorie abundance. And weirdly, even though you're eating a calorie surplus, the weight starts falling off your body because it doesn't need it anymore. And, 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 and the challenge is mother nature got interrupted and we're all stuck. We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Continuing education is both a requirement and a learning opportunity, but finding the right CE provider can be challenging. AATBS, a triad company, offers continuing education for psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, and behavior analysts. CE courses are available both individually and as part of our new All Access Pass. All Access Pass provides a library of over 250 unique courses. That's more than 800 hours of CEs, with new courses being added every month. As a special offer, Behavioral Health Today listeners can save 15% on CE purchases. Visit us at aatbs.com slash BHT and enter promo code BHT15 during checkout. That's aatbs.com slash BHT. Check out our library and check off your CE requirements today. Yeah, what a great description. What a wonderful description of how this whole metabolic part plays out in all of this. I, I want to kind of bring in the psychological perspective and what you're noticing and what you're encouraging folks with regards to their mindset, their perception, their emotional state, and how you address this in your book, Diabetic Food Mentality. Talk about the, those things right there, the mindset, perception, and the emotional state that you would really encourage people to move into. So mindset is a very important thing relative to food. And there's a little bit of a chicken and egg response to it because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, one of the things that happened when we first started doing our programs is one of my uh, team who'd been in the diet industry previously said, what are you going to do when you get people with eating disorders? And I, my, I had two answers for it. First, everybody has an eating disorder. Some people just have really bad ones. And then my second response to it is, no, listen, we're not here for the really bad ones. We're not here for anorexia. We're not here for bulimia. That's not what we're doing. No. You know what happened? People would come into the program and not disclose those conditions to us and then write to us in the seventh, eighth, and ninth week and say, um, it's over. I'm no longer purging. And, 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 and I, I'll explain this very important why that was happening. We had to dig into it. We had to do some research and we had to survey people and find out what was going on. Here's what's going on is that somebody who has one of those conditions is fundamentally malnourished, right? If they're anorexic, they're not eating enough. If they're bulimic, they're eating too much and vomiting it out but they're, they're, they then become malnourished. And as a function of being malnourished, they become emotionally unbalanced and they make bad food decisions, which causes more malnourished and they're in a feedback loop. All we ever did was show them how to improve nutrition. We didn't try to address their disorder in any way. We just improved nutrition. And by the time we got to about the sixth week, they're like, I no longer feel that way. Mm -hmm. So there's a chicken and egg thing with mindset and nutrition. I happen to believe that the simplest way to cure the vast majority of depression, sadness, anxiety is to eat properly. Like you'd be amazed how much stuff goes away uh, when you eat properly. But it's tough to eat properly unless you fix your mindset. So to address people's mindset, there's a lot of interesting perspectives, but the one is to recognize this, that 
everybody is dealing with some mild version of multiple personality disorder when it comes to food. I know this seems like a big statement, but it, it's it's true. Like, and and the best way to the best way to observe it is is that I'm sure you've been in the situation where you go to a party and you know maybe you're you've been on a diet and then somebody hauls out the tiramisu, and then you know you got this voice in there that says, "Hey, hey, hey, listen, listen, Graham, they got the tiramisu over there," and and then the other voice goes, "Hey, stop that, we're on a diet," mm. and then the other voice goes, "Yeah, but." but you've been doing so well, you know, you deserve a treat every now and again. How about just one bite? You know that one bite leads to more bites. It doesn't have to this time, <laughs> right? I mean, like- Talking about the angel, devil, on each soul. That's right. We talk about the food about angel and the food devil, right? <laughs> right. And, and, and so that's a very, very big part of, of people beginning to learn their food psychology because most yeah. people have this. And by the way, there's not just one food angel or food devil, I should say. Like mm. I, I know when I went through this exercise with myself, I found out that I had two really powerful ones. One was the whiny teenager. Oh, come on, can't we? No, we need it. Oh, but it's so you're good. And you know, when you work the so whiny hard, teenager and the parental kind of super exactly. ego saying no. Then you've got then you've also got the drug dealer. The drug oh. dealer's like this. The drug dealer's like, hey. <laughs> hey. Peter bought donuts to the office. <laughs> Angel's like, we're not, we're, we're not eating donuts at the moment. He goes, yeah, but they're, they're free. You know, and you can't, you don't want to give up the free ones. Okay, look, no, we're not doing it. Maybe just one, just yeah. one. You know, we've all had these dialogues, right? And so one of the big things we do with our clients is help them identify their food personalities around that. Yeah. Like what, you know, what are your manipulated, your internal manipulative tendencies? And then the next step that's really exciting about this is recognizing that the food industry has sponsored our emotions and hijacked our holidays. And they, they, they've done everything they can to shortcut our food decisions. So here we are, look, there are people who cannot experience Easter without chocolate. Like if there's no chocolate, it's not Easter. Well, I can just say that I went to an Anglican school as a, as a boy. And so we had Bible study and, and I've been through that document quite a few times. And I, I got to tell you, I have never, I've looked through it. You know, there he is, Jesus, and there's the trial, and then there's the whole putting him on the cross and all that kind of yeah. stuff. No chocolate. I didn't see any chocolate supper. at the Last Supper. Yeah, I didn't notice I, that. No, there was no chocolate. And and then I went I went and read the, the you know, the prequel, you know, the the, the, the nativity scene. And, the, you know, the, 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 the wise men, they brought frankincense, myrrh, and gold. Nobody have brought Christmas cake and candy canes. Like, Drink. how is it that those holidays have been hijacked so, so beautifully? And, and they've been hijacked so thoroughly that now people feel like they can't even experience that religious holiday without mm -hmm. that particular food. But they didn't stop there. Then they went to, it's four o'clock and you're feeling low of energy. You deserve a break today. You deserve a Kit Kat. You know, they, 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 went, they, they started sponsoring particular emotional responses. One of the things we do with our big groups and classes, like we might have a few thousand people on a given call, like on a Zoom call, and we ask them this, please, you guys all are the food doctor. And I want you to tell us what would you prescribe to help us solve depression? Chocolate, chocolate, ice cream, wine, chocolate, cake, ice cream, cookie, cookie, donut, chocolate, chocolate, wine, wine, chocolate, chocolate. Like that's, everybody knows, everybody knows. Yeah. Oh, what would you do to, uh, um, to, to deal with um, tremendous feelings of loneliness? Oh, definitely wine. Yeah, definitely. Yes, and and what those well, things what, do not help with depression or loneliness. But, they but, just but what you're holding up here though is, how brilliant. I, I tell parents, you know, dealing with, you know, phones and apps and things for social media for the kids. I tell them behind every, every app on your children's phone are 40 psychologists telling the industry when to put the bings and the whistles and the reward that come in that keep them like Vegas and tremendously reinforced that keep you stuck. What you're talking about right now is how powerful we have been conditioned, on, not, yep. not unlike lab rats, with these Post pre and post hypnotic, you know, suggestions. The conditioning of our mindset that gets yeah. us to begin to we hear a little bit of a bell and like Pavlov's dog, we begin to salivate. It's four o'clock, Kit Kat. Going through a difficult time, where's that bottle of wine? And we have this natural response that goes on. How powerful! How powerful that is. I was curious about one thing too. As you're talking, uh, when I was running my groups, I was always ask the folks, "Why are you here in this group?" And I would frame it in the, in the context of what was your it, the it that brought you here? One, one guy said, well, it was my wife threatening my life. If I don't go and get myself healthy, she's going to kill me before the diabetes does. 
Or one guy said, you know, or one woman said, you know, I, I, I want to see my granddaughter graduate. Yeah. What are some of the it's that you hear people coming in with that are shared as a way to get them to a stage of readiness, maybe for the very first time, to take a look at their life and possibly changing it? So we work with our clients um, with that principle very strongly, and we work with it from two sides. We create oh. something that we call a success tableau, mm -hmm. which is a very specific moment in your potential future that has such high emotional attachment for you that it can attract you through any challenge. And I'll, I'll yes. come back to that in a moment. Then the other thing we do is we create something called a rock bottom perspective. And rock bottom is a very interesting place. Um, if we use something extreme like alcoholism, what I would suggest is that rock bottom is the place of death or recovery. You know, you, you've gone so far that you either die or you recover. Yeah. And so what if we can find a way to get people to associate with rock bottom long before they hit it, mm. right? So what we do is we create a rock bottom tableau, which is to say, what is the moment that you most want to avoid based on your current track? And then we want to take your, your success tableau. So the rock bottom moments to your question that people typically want to avoid, and, and we often have to help them find this, but I, you know, it's like, I want you to imagine you're sitting in the doctor's office and there's a scan on the screen and your doctor is saying to you, there's a mass. Mm. Do you want to have that conversation? No. If you don't, then maybe it's time to make some changes. So there, there are these moments where it's like, and it's a very different thing to put it that way than say, do you want to avoid getting cancer? Right? It's a very different thing to put them in the moment in in moment, like um, on your current track, hey, you're pre-diabetic. I'm curious, how do you think you're going to feel about um, about having to take medications with side effects for the rest of your life? Yeah. It, you put them in the moments, and that helps a great deal. So that's one side of that question, and then the other side is these success tableaus. And the the basic idea here is is that I often use Martin Luther King as a junior as a as an example here is that when he gave his I Have a Dream speech, he gave us a clue as to why he was so committed. You know, we can talk about social justice and civil liberties and equality and all that kind of stuff. And those are the sort of esoteric goals that he had. But if you if you listen to that speech, you'll find that he actually lays out a moment in time that drew him through, a moment in time that made him so passionately engaged in this mission that he didn't care that they were going to kill him. He mm -hmm. specifically says in his mountaintop speech, he says, I may not get there with you, but I am fearing no man because I have been to the mountaintop and I have looked over and I have seen the promised land. Like he knew, he knew they were going to kill him, but he had this one tableau and the tableau was little white boys and girls playing on the streets in, happily, in happy bliss with little black girls, little black boys and girls playing on the street. That image meant more to him than the idea of civil justice and equality. So what we do with our clients is we ask them to go out and create that image. So one that I had with a client recently, which was really powerful, was similar to the one you mentioned. It was a, 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 but it was much more specifically into a moment. He says, I right now have a hard time getting off the ground or even standing up off a chair because of the pain in my knees. So my moment would be playing on the floor with my grandchildren and being able to get back up again without asking for help. I love it. And the minute he saw that, uh, it was the true north. And, 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 and what's so powerful about a, a, that, a, a true north is that suddenly it helps to filter all of your decisions. And of course, we've had many of these different true norths, but the other thing is, is that some of them are deep and some of them are shallow. And one thing we've learned about that is it's not up to us to judge whether shallow or deep is the way to go. I mean, it's whatever's going to draw you. So I had this woman... I was asking her, what, what's in it for you? And she's like, well, I'd like to have more energy. Okay, yeah, that's, I can hear that, but it doesn't. She goes, well, I'd really, I, you know, I, 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 my sex drive's a little off and, and I, I, you know, I feel like my husband and I would do better if my sex drive was a little better. Yeah, that's true, but I'm not hearing it. I'm not mm -hmm. hearing the total engagement. And, and then all of a sudden she goes, I want to be able to wear a two-piece swimsuit to the beach again. Bingo. And there it was. There it was. There, it, I have goosebumps from the moment. I love right? that. Yeah, I love that. There it was. She, that was the thing. Look, you can, somebody can judge her and go, oh, you're just a shout. No, it, whatever that is, like it's, no. that's what's going to draw her. That's going to be the next time she's driving along and the food devil goes, hey, there's a Dairy Queen over there. Then yep. the other, the angel's going to go, two piece bikini, baby. Like, I no. Totally, I totally agree. And, and so there, that, that stuff is very powerful. You know what I love about that? It's one of the coaches that, of course, at the Olympic level for volleyball, just a brilliant, brilliant man. He's kind of the John Wooden of volleyball. And I asked him one time, what, what separates the elite, the very best athletes, the 1% 
from those that are just so, so very good. And he said, well, the ones that, the, the ones that, the, that are the most elite, the best of the best, he says, they do nothing that would deviate from the goals that they set. And what you're saying, saying here is that that becomes the true north, that, 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 that two-piece bikini. I love that. That becomes her true north. Everything she does lines up with it. Everything deviates. Wait a minute. Something's wrong here. It's not in line with what my goal was. And there's something very organizing, something very motivating that really is so, so very helpful from the mindset that you're saying that this is what we can develop. And I love that you guys start out with these success, you know, tableaus and the rock bottom perspectives. What a great way to set a cornerstone piece. The mind is everything. And yeah. if we can align that properly, then we can make these choices about the right foods and everything else and what we say no to, yes to, and manage those different conversations we have on each side of our shoulders. What a nice start. One, one way to think about that is that, you know, imagine somebody in the doctor's office getting the bad news, right? What would they be willing to do at that point to change it? Yeah. Anything, right? Like anything. That's a good point. So when we recognize that the human experience only ever happens in the present, everything is in the present. There is nothing else. There is the present. There is your memory, your distorted, deleted, and generalized memory of the past, right? You know, mm -hmm. But you're, you're still experiencing that in the present. You're experiencing the memory of the past and the present. And then you've got the future. And well, the future is a projection. And you're experiencing your projection of that future in the present. So now, what do we want to do? Wait till the doctor's office moment is in the present? Or do we want to push our present day consciousness out into that future consequence, yeah. engage with it so powerfully and emotionally that we get to have the same level of motivation 10 years early? Yeah. I like that term, age with it now. Start aging with it now and get it 10 years under your belt and get it into your marrow and let it be the path with which you develop these very deeply furrowed paths that you choose just automatically. Hey, let me ask you a quick question, if you don't mind me asking, just uh, what's your thoughts on those with diabetes? I still work with a couple of diabetic patients now, but they're, they're your work with them and intermittent fasting. Do you have uh, much about that? Well, intermittent fasting, what happens in the diet industry is something comes along and it works a little bit and people turn it into an extreme. So you have this baby bathwater thing where it's like, I'm going to just do this. Like, you know, keto came along and ketosis yeah. is a very valuable uh, biological function of the body, but it's not a lifestyle. And the minute it came along, it became a lifestyle. And then it went from lifestyle to brand. And the minute you, you could buy keto pancakes, you knew we were all in trouble. So, you know, what, what I would say is the same thing kind of happened with intermittent fasting. What, what I would say is in, in WildFit, we, we use something called natural nutritional rhythms, which is to say, look at the way our ancestors likely ate, and that will probably give you some clues as to how we optimize for digestion. So as an example, what's the perfect breakfast? Your own body fat. Like mm -hmm. you shouldn't be eating first thing because our ancestors didn't have food storage. So they woke up in the morning and the only way they had any food is if they had some meat left over from the hunt from the day before. And that's not so likely either. So what did that mean? It meant immediately they had to get up and go for a walk. So what I said, suggested, this is not intermittent fasting. This is a natural nutritional rhythm. Get up, go for a walk, yeah. then come back and eat. And, and in the case of, I mean, men and women can do this, but in the case of men, I would say that after a long hunt, what was the first thing you ate? Protein, right? Because you've now done all this damage to your muscles. And so your body's looking for assimilation and, and eating protein at that point would be really ideal. Same thing at night. What the hell are you doing eating before you go to bed? And, and by the way, I, I, there's a really good reason for not doing it. You probably know this, but um, you, know, you produce human growth hormone at night. Mm -hmm. And the problem is this human growth hormone is very, very, very susceptible to insulin. The minute you've got insulin, it breaks down your growth hormone. So now you've got all these people that are producing the literal fountain of youth right inside their own body. I mean, you could go to Gold's Gym and buy it for $800 a month or something, but you make it yourself. Right. But the trouble is, is that most people are snacking on insulin causing foods um, and breaking down their own growth hormones. So in that sense, we agree that you shouldn't eat for the four hours or so before you go to bed. But I don't call it intermittent fasting. I call it natural eating. Really good. I really like that. More important for diabetics, in my opinion, and you'll see this in the book, is that these metabolic modes... Ketosis is a very healthy mm -hmm. seasonal state that everyone should live with if they want to be disease free, but they shouldn't live with it every day all year. And so I believe that, you know, if, if I'm dealing with somebody who's got, say, weight to release or they've got diabetes to reverse, let's say that they're both going to eat the same amount of sugar. That's okay. They can eat the same amount of sugar and one of them will fail every single time and the other one will exceed massively as long as they change one thing about that sugar. And that is, that I'd rather you ate the sugar, the same amount of sugar for three days, of, but eat it all in that three days 
and then don't eat sugar for the other 27 days rather than eating a little bit every day. And that's one of the things the diet industry is, oh, you can have just a little bit today. You yeah. can have a little bit. Well, every single day that you eat sugar, your body gets the message that winter is coming. So that's it. You're not, you're gonna, you're not gonna release any weight and what have you. So more than intermittent fasting, I suggest that spring in WildFit, which is you know healthy, clean ketosis, is, is a very valuable tool. And full water fasting is a very valuable tool. Really good. Just real quick too, define for us what ketosis is for our listeners' benefit. Sure. I could give you like a boring scientific sort of uh, definition if you like, but you can, you can find that online. Let me give you more of an explanation, I think. Appreciate it. First of all, the pancreas is a magical organ and um, and, it, and it, it, it's more than a dual function organ. For the, for the sake of this conversation, it's a dual function organ. It produces insulin and it produces glucagon. When you're eating carbohydrates, it produces insulin to immediately metabolize to get rid of that sugar because too much sugar in your blood in your blood will kill you. So your 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 pancreas is pushing out this insulin, and that insulin is opening up your cells and letting the sugar go into those cells, and that's the job. That's what it's supposed to be doing. When you are not eating carbohydrates of any kind, the pancreas switches gears and it starts producing glucagon, and glucagon communicates with the body that it can start releasing glycogen stores and fat stores. So you switch fuel sources. When you switch fuel sources, you are now move, you're moving into fat burning or you're moving into ketosis. It's called ketosis because of course what you're producing is ketones and they're showing up in your blood and your urine and now you're in ketosis. What's happened with ketosis is that because it can work, you know, Atkins really popularized it many years ago, because it can work, people threw the baby out with the bathwater and said it's the only way to live. And I would put to you that being trapped in ketosis permanently, while not as dangerous as being trapped in sugar season permanently, is also not a good idea. I would agree. I would agree. I, I, you know, we're kind of winding kind of the corner here, but I, I'd love you to share maybe a success story that stands out to you, maybe a testimonial from somebody that comes in and says, hey, Eric, this is my beginning. This is where I started. This is my life. And here's where I'm, here's where I'm going or here's where I've gone since I've kind of looked at your book, your nine-week program, et cetera. Give us a success story, would you? So, you know, there's a very recent one, and I, you know, it, it, I, I don't think I've ever shared this on an interview before because it's very recent. But um, a, a woman, Sophie, uh, she she did our program about a year and a half ago, and she had found, like many people, that as she crossed over certain age thresholds, um, that her metabolism began to sort of betray her a little bit, and you know, weight started creeping on, and then there were some life events and what have you. And the next thing you know, she was fairly dramatically overweight, and guess what? Diabetic. And so, you know, this, this was her life. And, um, and, and so recently she, she wrote to me and she said, listen, I'm no longer diabetic and I've lost 60 pounds, which is, I mean, <laughs> it's like that, that's as much as you're allowed to carry on the plane, as far as I know. Like it, it's, it's right at the limit of your, of your it's, it's, it's a lot of weight to be carrying around. And, and so she's, a, and then she goes, um, and I asked her about this, I'm like, how does it affect you? And she says, it affects me in every conceivable way. I have energy again. She, she walks about 20,000 steps a day. Now, some people might make the mistake of saying that she walked 20,000 steps a day to get rid of the to get rid of the weight. Nope. Now that she's healthy, she wants to be out moving. Because she can. Yeah. And, and no kidding. I mean, just as a measure of how, how you know, she, she, she calls me and she says, listen, she's in, in the United Kingdom. She calls me and says, we, we have a major problem over here in the United Kingdom with obesity and diabetes. And I'm like, uh, you're, don't, you're not alone on this. And she goes, yeah, but, but I want to do something about it. She goes, can you be in London next week? And I'm like, uh, I could. Well, this is now about four weeks ago. So I got on a plane and flew to London. With the, I land at eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, I, she meets me immediately. First of all, she's felt and looking amazing. And of course, I know what she looked like previously. So it was, you know, she sent me a picture. It was, it was a dramatic difference. Mm. Now she starts telling me, you know, who she is and what she does. She's a parliamentary consultant working, you know, working in government. So my first meeting is at nine o'clock at parliament. And I'm meeting an MP to talk about obesity and diabetes in, in, in the UK. And then the next thing you know, I, you know, the next night I'm at the Winter Garden Party. I'm having a chat with the with the finance minister. They call them the Chancellor of the Exchequer there. And I'm having a conversation with the health minister. And what was striking to me about all of this is, first of all, how open and willing they were to talk about this because it's costing the United Kingdom. You know, they have natural they, they have nationalized health care there. Uh, you know, I guess to some degree similar to Canada, but it's called the, the National Health Service of the NHS. Diabetes is costing NHS 1.5 million pounds per hour, per hour, right? So the first thing I was really impressed by is how um, open everybody was to talking about this and they, they're eagerly looking for solution. But the second thing that struck me was 
As we walked up and met these people, we met David Cannon, the previous prime minister. We walked up, he look, took one look at her and he goes, holy crap, what happened to you? Like, you look amazing. And every single person we met either made that comment or told me about how they made that comment when they first saw her after this waiting. So what I'm getting at is that when we get these success stories, and I mean, we have literally thousands of them, what happens is, is that not only are we talking about the enhanced quality of life that that individual person gets, that person gets to sleep better, that person gets to, you know, have energy again, that person gets to not be sick so often, and maybe not at all, and that person probably lives longer, that person probably doesn't spend the last, you know, 20 years of their life plugged into machines and undergoing surgeries, but also that person sets an example of possibility. Yes. And that's and she can do what happened. I can do. It. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, what what a what a what a wonderful story, and, and congratulations on that. What a what a platform to have. It's been and what a what a success story to have that brings you into this platform that can maybe change or make some significant changes at a national level as well. Well, Eric, I have so enjoyed our time, and I, I would love our listeners as we wind down for today to learn more about you and your work and your book, Post Diabetic and Easy to follow a nine-week guide to reversing pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. How can people follow up with you after our show today? Well, you can always go to postdiabetes.com where there's a bunch of resources and information about diabetes and the book information is there and so on. Postdiabetes.com um, is a great place to go. Uh, the book is obviously available wherever you would find books. Uh, I, you know, Amazon being the the, the, the the top pick for most people. And uh, so you can certainly go find it. It's hardcover, paperback, Audible. I read the Audible myself, so it's not not uh, nice. not actor. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 I and I'd add this by the way. Two two very important points about that is that um, some people are like, well, I'm not really concerned about diabetes. Or why would I buy a book called Post Diabetic? Well, what I will tell you is that more than seven out of ten people living in America, and therefore the rest of the developed world, are on the diabetic spectrum somewhere. You should be reading that book as a preventative measure. Yeah. I don't until you have the condition. Um, you know, it's 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 a preventable thing and a reversible thing. And the other thing is, is that in the book, in the first print run, so anybody listening to this podcast, say within say four or five months of it being published, the first print run of the book includes a free place in our diabetes reversal program. So it's a two hundred fifty dollars online program, and they buy the book and they get to do that program. Uh, you know, it's video based, self study at home. It's really easy to do, um, and it guides them through. Me, it's, it's videos of me discussing each of the steps. So it takes the nine week journey that's in the book and turns it into a thirteen week multimedia journey, and you get to do that completely for free with the book. And um, and if anybody is you know like you know wanting to get, connect with me generally, I yeah I, I um, I'm at eric.ee www.eric.ee and I manage my own Instagram page. I, I, I actually do reply to people. And uh, so if anybody wants to follow up, that's where they can find me. That's awesome, man. Well, I, you know, I know your book gives folks a solid step-by-step -step plan in which they're going to learn about making some of the subtle changes to their lifestyle and their food mentality and the deep changes to their psychology, all of which might be able to help them reverse their condition. Or like you're saying right here, prevent something that is so preventable and not just not have something, but have a really thriving life health-wise that we can all attain. So congratulations on your book and your work. And it's been awesome, Eric, to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. I agree. I also want to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining Eric and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and its resources and all of our other episodes can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. Thanks again for being with us on the show. I look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavioral Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community. And if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tried Behavioral Health Network, all rights reserved.